Good morning, everybody. Our scripture reading for this morning is in the book of Luke, chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it, where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of the sight of, to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Lord God Almighty, our Father in heaven, we thank you for another Sunday morning. Lord, we thank you for the healing you have sent us, the deliverance, the, re the recovery, and the sight that we may see. Uh, thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning. Somebody go out and see if they can find the sun, okay? <laughs> 456, singing all four verses.
You may be seated. As we continue on with our praying for Indiana church planters, this week we're looking at the Bible Life Community Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And they have some specific things that they have said. We would like prayer concerning our leadership, finances, evangelism and outreach, and wisdom concerning potential buildings. And they certainly appreciate our prayers. Um, they are starting up very fresh, and so they have a lot of very new church planting needs in Fort Wayne. Fort Wayne, as you know, is a... Uh, there's a lot going on there, and they have a lot that they are involved in. Um, you can see by the pictures that they are doing quite a bit, quite a bit for the Fort Wayne area. So I would encourage you to pray for the Bible Life Community Church in Fort Wayne this week as we continue our Annie Armstrong uh, goal for our collection for North American Missions. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your church, that your church is so in about reaching out into the community, into North America, into Indiana, and planting churches to share the good news of the gospel. Bible Life Community Church in Fort Wayne is a, is a new church. It's starting off robustly, and it is blessed with all of the problems of, of growing. And we pray that your hand and your work would be done there in Fort Wayne, Indiana. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We have some announcements. Um, before we get to the special announcements tonight, I'd like to remind everybody of our business meeting and fellowship tonight. Fellowship meal at 6 o'clock tonight. The business meeting to follow at 7 o'clock. Um, we have our looking back to look forward spring revival series. I know everyone has sprung forward this morning with the time change, seeing all the smiling faces in the congregation today. But we will be doing our revival on April the 1st, and that's not April Fool's either. And it is a Easter Sunday morning, so we will be able to do a lot of praise and worship and reviving of our church. Also, we are engaged in our back-to-school backpack collection, so don't forget, this is March, so we are looking for blue and black pens, glue sticks, loose-leaf paper, the wide-ruled kind of loose-leaf paper, and of course the backpacks. You can drop your donations off with either myself or Kathy, and we can fit them in with everything else, as well as the uh, donation basket that's out here in the foyer underneath the outreach table. Also... Next, we have the uh, ladies' retreat, the transformed women's uh, gathering. You can either get involved by participating, actually in going, which should be a great time, or you can sponsor one of the ladies who are going, and Kathy has all that information for you if you're wanting to do one or the other. I believe you've already gotten the ball rolling on that. Everybody's registered and we're just waiting for the day. All right. It's a good thing. So, I don't think there's another one. There's not another one, is there? I don't think. We have our regular uh, opportunities this week to worship, serve, and grow and fellowship. Wednesday night Bible study. Of course, Thursday night connect. Um, I think that's all that's going on this week. Other than all regular outreach opportunities, if you want to get involved in that, you can contact me. Let me know. We'll we do our Monday morning donut run. So that always happens every Monday. So welcome one another as we uh, look towards the future, looking forward, right? <laughs>
Let's take our hymnals and turn to page 473. right across the page to 472.
Brother Tim, you ask for your blessed offering this morning for us. Sure, have you, Father. Thank you for bringing us all together in your beautiful house today. Let me lay this offering to do the good work that, that you would have it do. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. As we continue on our series of brokenness today, we'll look at Christ. We're going to look at Jesus in brokenness. And there's a, there's a few passages of scripture that we'll look at. Some of them more lengthy than others, of course. However, when we think of Jesus in brokenness, uh, immediately most people will think to the cross. And that's a good thing. Because the cross is where brokenness becomes healed. So we're going to look at a couple different passages instead. We're going to look at something different in referring to brokenness. Um, Vance Havner is a, an old-timey pastor, good, good man of God who studied the word faithfully. And he says this, he says, God uses broken things. It takes broken soil a crop, broken clouds to give rain, broken grain to give bread, broken bread to give strength. It is the broken alabaster box that gives forth perfume. 
It is Peter, weeping bitterly, who returns to greater power than ever. God uses broken things. So I would have us turn into the Gospel of Matthew. And we'll look at some brokenness today. Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 6. While Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman approached him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume. She poured it on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw it, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This might have been sold for a great deal and given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a noble thing for me. You will always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Perfume on my body, she has prepared me for burial. Truly I tell you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the usefulness that you make of broken things, that the service that we can give to you is a appreciated, it's loved, and it's out of love. I thank you for your word that you give us, that we can continue to grow and walk closer with you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We get some interesting fillers in different parts of scripture. Uh, In Mark, we're told that the da, 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 da. no it wasn't mark luke sorry in luke we're told that she was washing her feet his feet as well In Luke, we're told that the perfume was applied to his feet as well as his head. And that she washed his feet with her tears. She wiped his feet with her hair. And that there was a question asked. The question was... If this man, if he were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this woman is who is touching him. He's thinner. We get a little bit more insight there in Luke about the kind of people that Jesus dealt with and had around him and the kind of people that came to Jesus. See, the interesting thing about this little alabaster jar was that for it to be useful, it had to be broken. This perfume that was trapped inside of it, the perfume that was trapped inside of it could not be used until its container, its vessel was broken. To be of service to Christ, this jar had to be broken. And the woman who comes to Jesus with this perfume, she was broken too. She was broken as well. Now, interestingly enough, Jesus responds to this position in Luke. Jesus says in Luke 7, verse 40, Simon, I have something to say to you. He said, say it, teacher. Verse 41, 
A creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Since they could not pay it back, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one he forgave more. You have judged correctly, he told him. Turning to the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she with her tears has washed my feet and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with olive oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. That's why she loved much. But the one who's forgiven little loves live little. When we know our brokenness, we love God's forgiveness even more. If we don't think about ourselves as being broken, sinful people, we don't look at God's love and forgiveness in the same way. When we do away with our own pride and accept the reality that we are a broken people, that we are sinful people, that we have not the ability on our own to stand righteously. When we come to that understanding and that realization, then we are able to love God more. We are able to love Jesus more. The brokenness of our pride and our arrogance and our own self-worth becomes a great service to the king. Because we then turn around and tell others of the forgiveness and the love and the compassion and the grace and the mercy that God has given to us. Not because we deserve it, not because we earn it, not because we have done enough on our own to achieve it, but that it is a offering to us freely Jesus goes on to say to her in verse 48 your sins are forgiven now those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves who is this man who even forgives sins And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. See, the broken are for the service of the king. The broken pride, broken heart, the broken alabaster jar. We're also going to look at how the broken seeks out Jesus. This woman sought out Jesus because she knew she was broken. Jesus takes brokenness and makes it whole. And Jesus was broken for us. That jar of perfume needed to be broken. The pride needed to be broken. And the broken seek out Jesus. Not only this, this woman here at this dining sequence, but we can see in Matthew chapter 9, we can see a couple of different people who are broken. 
Matthew chapter 9, verse 18. As he was telling these things to them, suddenly one of the leaders came and knelt down before him saying, My daughter just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. We find out later on in Mark that this leader's name was Jairus. 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 He came to seek out Jesus. He was broken with grief and loss. His young daughter had died. So Jesus and his disciples got up and followed him. Just then, a woman who had suffered from bleeding for 12 years approached from behind and touched the hem of his robe for she said to herself if I can just touch his robe I'll be made well this woman sought out Jesus because she was broken and she knew that healing comes from Jesus she knew that she needed to seek out Jesus. Now, again, Mark gives us more info, more information. Said that she was suffering for 12 years and had endured much under many doctors. She had spent everything she had and was not helped at all. On the contrary, she became worse. So the healing that was offered to her through earthly doctors, man, just didn't help her. She was still incomplete. She was still broken and sought out Jesus, having just heard about Jesus. And she didn't ask him anything. She didn't approach him for anything. She believed that all she needed to do was just touch the hem of his garment. That that would be enough. Jesus turned and saw her. Have courage, daughter, he said. Your faith has saved you. And the woman was well from that moment. Now this woman was unclean according to the law. Leviticus 15.25 says very clearly that this woman was unclean. And for her to have come to a rabbi, a teacher, or any other person and touch them made them unclean. But Jesus does something different to people. See, our brokenness and our uncleanness doesn't make Jesus unclean when we come to him. Her uncleanness didn't get transferred to Jesus. On the contrary, the opposite happened. She became whole through Christ. Jesus takes the broken and makes them whole. We don't make him broken. When we come to Christ, when we approach him, he does something to us. John, the Gospel of John in chapter 11, gives us a lot of inf information. It was Mary who was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. 
It was her brother, Lazarus, who was sick. Her sister, Martha, sent a message to Jesus to let him know that the one whom he loved is sick. And when Jesus heard this, this is an important verse. I'd like you to like you to kind of take note of this. John chapter 11 verse 4. When Jesus heard this, he said, "This sickness will not end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it." God has a plan to deal with brokenness. And it all results in his glorification. In the glory of God. Because see, taking the broken, taking the sinful, taking the unclean, and making them whole is a miraculous work that only God can do. So Jesus then rushes out and hurries to get to Lazarus because he's sick. He even hired a carriage to carry him with, with much haste, right? No. As a matter of fact, he lingers for two more days before going. Lingers for two more days. And Jesus said this to them. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm on my way to wake him up. And the disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he'll get well. Jesus, however, was speaking about his death. And they thought he was speaking about natural sleep. So Jesus had to tell them plainly, Lazarus has died. And not only that, but he also says, I'm glad for you that I wasn't there so that you may believe. But let's go get him. Let's go to him. When Jesus arrived and found that Lazarus had been in the tomb for four long days, many of the Jews had come to visit Martha and Mary, and they were trying to comfort them. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she ran out to meet him. And Martha says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And that's a true statement, because Jesus was a healer. Jesus demonstrated before this that he was able to heal the sick. This is a profession of faith that Martha said. And she continues and says that yet even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus comforts her and says, your brother will rise again. And she says back, yes, I know, I know he'll rise again. He'll rise again on the resurrection at the last day. Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives 
and believes in me will never die. believe this yes Lord I believe you are the Messiah the Son of God who comes into the world Mary tells Mary is told she got up went to him She says the same thing. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. See, Jesus knew because he said before, this sickness will not end in death. It will end in God's glory. Our death is not a permanent one. Our sin sickness, our brokenness will not end in death. But it ends in the glory of God. There are so many sermons that have been preached on verse 35. Two simple words. We could spend an entire year covering the depth of what it means. Jesus wept. And I could imagine there were more voices in the crowd than just what we see here in the Gospel of John. See how he loved him? Couldn't he have eyes of blind men have kept this man from dying? Couldn't he have prevented death? I'm sure there were a lot more things that were being said around the tomb there are broken hearts in this crowd there are broken lives in this crowd there are probably many who did not believe in him in this crowd gathered around trying to comfort Mary and Martha over the loss of their brother Some of them were even saying, well, there's nothing he can do now. Lazarus is dead. Martha, after the stone is rolled away, says, it already stinks. He's been dead for four days. There's nothing that can be done. And Jesus' reply is something that we need to hold on to. Didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? See the glory of God. That's an experience to have, to see the glory of God right before us. See, this situation is filled with all kinds of brokenness. And Jesus takes that brokenness 
and turns it into a glorification for God. And makes them whole. Father, I thank you that you heard me, is what Jesus says. I thank you that you heard me. I know that you always hear me. But because of the crowd standing here, I said this. So that they may believe you sent me. It's not for his own benefit, but for the benefit of those whom are gathered to see God's glory at work, to see God working through Christ. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, bound hand and foot, linen strips, and with his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unwrap him and let him go. What kind of response would you have had having stood there in this situation how would you see God at work would you have been skeptical seeing a bound man come walking out of an unsealed tomb would you have been frightened Because Jesus was there, the end result was glory. The end result was praise. The end result was worship. The end was, was result was that those who were there got to see the power of God at work. got to see how broken things were made whole. Broken things were made useful. And of course we have the brokenness that Christ suffered on our behalf. In Luke twenty two nineteen. We are told that he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, he gave it to them and said, this is my body, which is given for you. See, Jesus had to be broken on our behalf. Jesus had to suffer on our behalf because our sins required justice and they require a righteous God to act righteously against sin. And so that the broken may be made whole, Christ was broken for us on our behalf, willingly, not because he had to be, but because he wanted to be. Because it was love that motivated that act. Is the only way in which restoration can occur. Our restoration with our Father in heaven. First Corinthians eleven twenty three and twenty four say, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. 
on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord took bread, and when he gave him thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. See, the key is, is that we remember. That we remember what it is that Christ did for us, what he gave for us in order to rebuild the gap that sin creates. He was pierced for our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds, Isaiah 53, 5. Punishment for our peace. See, we can rest peacefully. We can be restored because of the wounds and the piercings and the punishment that he took on our behalf. After his anguish, he will see light and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will carry their iniquities. The righteous servant, Jesus Christ, made a way for the broken to be healed. The righteous servant carried the iniquities of many so that they might be restored. And it all works to bring God glory. How great it is that we don't have to face the wrath against sin because it had been paid for us already on our behalf because of Christ. And that alone is the most glorious gift God can give. Peter and Paul agree because Paul writes in Romans that he was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Our justification that we can stand before a judge not guilty. Justified. Peter says that he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. So we have a, a wonderful opportunity because God's word is faithful and it tells us this whole history of redemption that God set the plan up in order that the rebellion of sin be dealt with justly, righteously, that the evil in the world will come to And that through Christ, we might have a restored relationship with God. That we might dwell with Him forever and ever and ever. Because through Christ, the broken are healed. Through Christ, the sin barrier is torn down. I want to leave you with a passage from Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 14. Heal me, Lord, 
and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved, for you are my praise. We have a great healer, we have a great Savior. If we want to look for healing and saving, we only need to turn to the Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word, for your salvation, and for your healing. That you have opened up a door to us that we might walk through to dwell with you forever. That our hearts may delight in your instruction and that we might continually grow closer to you, to serve you, to show and shine the light of your glory to others in this community, Lord. I pray that if there's anyone who has not called out for healing and salvation, that they might do so today. That we might rejoice together with them. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.